All right, so I asked you to view a video assignment last night, kind of bringing all these different theorems together that we've discussed so far this year. We had the intermediate value theorem like way back in unit one, and then we had the extreme value theorem, which is what we covered right before break. And over the last two days, we've been looking at the mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem. So we have all four theorems that are kind of similar because they have very similar conditions. It's just the conclusion at the end um, is different for all of them. So we're going to take a look at kind of two more free response type examples today just to get an idea or used to how these theorems show up in like certain types of questions. They're not, they're usually not going to state the theorem by name. Okay, it's, some, it's usually up to us to determine can we use the theorem, can we not, which one are they kind of referring to. Okay, um, before we start on page 292 though, I need to say thank you because everyone in here viewed the video assignment last night, so that made me very happy. I did have um, a few people though comment that they don't like these anymore as much as they used to which everyone's entitled to their opinion, so I completely understand why, okay? Uh, or I can, I, complete, I can completely understand that. What I want to know is why, and you don't have to voice it out loud if you were one of those people that said that. Um, my guesses would be that this video assignment may have been a little bit more trickier than previous ones, so maybe you didn't like it for that reason. Um, maybe it's the first one we've had since break, and we're not really used to them anymore. Um, maybe it's because this one was uh, slightly longer than previous ones have been. So it could be any of those. I did want to highlight, though, if you're one of those people that feel that way, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. So I've been, being the math person I am, I've been number crunching all year, like trying to see if these video assignments and activities are worth it. Like, are they actually doing what I want them to do? And after I've been comparing our numbers this year to the numbers I had the previous two years, I am anticipating that our pass rate is almost double what it has been the last two years on the AP exam. So that means almost twice as many people are going to pass it as what they have done in the past. So I'm very optimistic about that. And when I think about certain variables, like scientifically, what could affect that, the only things that have changed from this year compared to the last two years are the students and these video assignments. So I don't know if I'm using the same notes, I'm using roughly the same tests and quizzes, just with different numbers or, or wording, um, but either we are a very, very group, good group of kids which we are, um, or these video assignments are working. And it can be a mixture of the two. But for those of you that don't like them as much as perhaps you used to, I need to tell you that I'm going to keep up with them throughout this year because if I don't, I don't really want to see that potential of doubling the pass rate go down, if you can understand that. Okay. Um, the, there is some trade-off. I know that it's like 20 or 25 minutes at, at night for these video assignments, but that means we can do about 40 minutes of activities or board work in here. So we do have that trade-off. Speaking of board work or activities, we're going to have a, a practice day tomorrow. Okay? Any other questions or comments? Yes? If you don't pass, can you not do Cal No. You mean next year? Yeah. No, you can take it. That's fine. Your score on the AP exam has zero effect on your grade in here or what you can take next year. Okay, it only affects whether you can transition that um, credit to a college or not, whether you earn it or not. Okay, so that also brings up a good point. I've had students that have unfortunately not passed in this course, but then they take Calc 2 and they pass there it's almost like a, a second chance, if you will. And sometimes they do much better in that course than in this one, but I'll go over kind of the differences between the two when scheduling comes around. Okay, yeah? When you take Calc BC, say you, like, you don't pass the AB test, if you pass the, pass the BC, can you take like, Calc 
it depends on the score you get and where and where you want to go to school that they have different criteria. Um, I know in some universities, if you get a four out of five on the BC course, you can go into Calc 3. Some schools require a five. It just depends on the, the cutoff that they want. Okay. Also, on the Calc 2 test, you receive an AB subscore. So if you don't pass this year, you do have that opportunity to pass if you take it again next year. Okay. But I'm very optimistic for this year, so let's not have that mindset. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so on page 292, we're going to take a look at two more examples. And we're just going to get used to kind of the wording, how these theorems show up, how we can use them, all that jazz. So we have a car company um, introduces a new car which has a certain amount of cars sold. So we're going to use that for S. And it's modeled by this function where T is in months. So looking for part A here, find the value of the derivative of this S function at 2.5. Okay, so we're going to find the derivative, plug in a value, see what we get, and there's a little bit more to it. We want to make sure that we apply units because we do have a scenario behind this equation, and then we're going to write what that uh, value actually means in this context. Okay, so how do you want to go about finding the derivative? Maybe we'll worry about plugging in 2.5 later. Can we find some shortcuts perhaps? Yeah. All right, let's simplify it or clean it up first. So this would be 1500 minus 2700 over t plus 2. All right, uh, derivative time. Derivative of 1500? zero, and then we have to subtract the derivative of 2700 over t plus 2. How do you want to do that derivative? Do we feel like quotient? Because it's a fraction? Okay, so we'll do low and then d high, derivative of 2700 zero minus high d low, derivative of t or x, if you want to change it to an x, would just be one <coughs> and all over the bottom squared. All right, so if we clean it up, t plus 2 times 0 is going to go away, and then we're subtracting 2,700. But notice how we have an additional negative out front. So if we are subtracting a negative, that will change to a positive. And we have t plus 2 squared on the bottom. So there's our cleaned up derivative. Let's go ahead and plug in 2.5. This is why you may need your calculator. One point three or one three three point three 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 three. Where did this come from? We did. Oh, we took the derivative of it. Derivative of a number is zero. Is that better? Okay. Can we get that? All right. Let's go ahead and throw in some units and try to explain what this number means. <coughs> so if we're dealing with a derivative, it's a rate. Okay, think about like dy over dx. We got to figure out what was the y unit over the x unit. Yeah? Cars sold per month. Cars sold per 
month. So that's the correct units. Now they want us to explain what this value represents in the context of the problem. Okay, did we, I'm pretty sure we practiced our phrasing or our units when it comes to kind of eva evaluating or interpreting what these numbers mean. If it's a derivative, it's representing a rate, right? Okay, so this would be the rate at which the number of cars sold is increasing or decreasing. Yeah? Increasing. Good. Derivative is positive. Okay, specifically in cars sold per month. So, uh, we also should specify the point in time. So the rate at which the number of cars sold is increasing when uh, the time is 2.5 months. So at that specific moment in time, okay, in, into this year that they're using, they are selling, um, the rate at which they're selling is increasing. So they're selling more cars than they had previously. This is not the number or the amount of cars that they've sold. This is how quickly that number is going up. Okay, cars sold per month. How, how fast it's increasing. Are we doing okay? Yes? So the, the rate at which the cars are being sold is increasing or the number of cars sold? There's a difference between those two statements and I may have used the, the different one. So this is saying the rate is increasing, which would be a second derivative, right? Okay, we may have to go back to the drawing board. Let's try that again. The number of cars sold is increasing at this rate when t equals 2.5. I use the word rate too soon in the previous statement. I like that one better. Is that better for you, Jack? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, okay. So my previous statement said the rate was increasing. Okay, that would in, in, or signify a second derivative. I had to flip the word rate. So the, the function itself, the number of cars being sold is increasing at this rate. I like that one better. Good check, Jack. Okay, um, let's see. So that's a derivative, okay, an instantaneous rate of change, okay, that I rock that we were kind of using uh, the other day in terms of our new phrasing, instantaneous rate of change. Part B is asking us about the average rate of change over the first 12 months. So average rate of change is that slope of the secant line, okay, the slope between two points. Can we figure out what two points they, uh, we should use in this case that we would use for our interval? Yeah. Um, Probably zero and 12. Zero is like your starting amount. One would be after the first month. So we're gonna have to plug in zero to see what we get and then plug in 12 and see what we get. So we're gonna use the original function. Again, you might need to use your calculator. Do we get 150 if you plug in zero? Okay. Okay. 
and a 1300 number for the other one. <clears throat> All right, so slope between two points, throw back to algebra one. This is gonna be our average rate of change. We need the difference of the y's over the difference of the respective x's. Ninety six and some change. All right, can we throw in some units for this answer and maybe explain what it means in the context of the problem? What do you think, Jess? It's an average. Okay, so it's still the same units, car sold per month, okay? But instead of being the rate at one point in time, because that's what a derivative is, this is the rate um, on average for the entire year. So if you were to count where they started to where they end and averaged it, this is the rate um, at which they were selling cars. So at some points in the year, they're selling uh, cars more quickly because obviously 133.333 one, one, three, 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 three was higher than this average, but at some other points they were selling cars less quickly, okay, at some smaller rate. So this is just an average from where you start to where you end. So we'll say the number of cars sold is increasing on average, okay, because this was an average rate of change, at this rate over the first year. Some might be a little less, some is a little more, but it's just an average. Okay, if you think about our driving example, okay, um, for instance, if you go to the mills, maybe your average speed is 50 miles per hour, but hopefully you're traveling less than that in front of the school, and hopefully you're traveling a little bit faster than that on 28, okay, or else you might get hit by someone going too fast. So it's an on average, okay, beginning point and ending point, taking those into consideration. Are we doing okay with the difference between the instantaneous and the average? Yeah. Would that be car sold per month squared? We're eventually going. We're eventually going to talk about the month squared. But if we use these numbers to help us with the units, these values came from S, which is just representing cars sold, okay. and we're dividing by these numbers, which represent month values. So this is really cars sold per month. Okay. okay? Um, we'll eventually get into the squared part, though, in a few more sections. Okay. All right. Let's try the last one. Is it possible, yes or no, that a value of C somewhere in this first year, okay, is there some point in time in this first year where the derivative, okay, the rate at one point in time is equal to the average rate over that year? Does that phrasing look familiar? Can we think about what this is kind of hinting towards? Yeah? Yep. MBT. I rock equals A rock. Okay, instantaneous rate of change, meaning derivative, equals average rate of change. Okay, mean value theorem. So, first of all, it's asking us is it possible? So, we gotta think about the conditions of the mean value theorem and see if they're met. Okay, what are the conditions of the mean value theorem? Want to give it a shot, Hannah? Continuous and differentiable on the interval. 
Okay. So looking at the original function, can you think of a number for t that would cause you to have an issue somewhere? Is there a number that wouldn't work in that function? Yeah? It's not in the interval. Okay, so we'll say t equals negative 2 is not a problem because not in interval. So we can kind of check off continuity. The only problem we would have is not in the spot that we're focusing on. Let's try differentiable. So we know what the derivative is. We actually did that in part A. Okay, that was this 2700 over t plus 2 squared. So if you think about if there would be an issue for this derivative function, that would happen at negative 2 as well, but it's not in the interval. So we can kind of use the same reasoning for this differentiable part as well. So it looks like we are continuous and differentiable. So if the conditions are met, then the answer to this yes or no question must be yes. Is it possible? Okay. We'll say yes because the function is continuous and differentiable on the interval. So we answered the question, we gave a reason for our answer, and then the last part, if such a value exists, which we said that there is, okay, the mean value theorem is um, applicable here, they want us to find it. So we're going to try to find that special spot where the average rate of change is equal to this instantaneous rate of change. So let's go ahead and take those pieces. I think we already have those available to us. Instantaneous rate of change means derivative. Do we already know what the derivative function is? We had that in the top, right? 2700 over t plus 2 squared. Do we already know what the average rate of change is over the first year? That was the 96.4286 number. Okay. So notice how part A and B are kind of leading us into this part C. All right, so from here, we're just going to solve for t, try to find that special spot, and according to the mean value theorem, it should definitely be a number between 0 and 12. All right, so let's see if we can solve for that. Do you guys think you can do that on your own? Solve for t? Maybe multiply over the denominator to get rid of the fraction, and then go from there. Three point two nine one five. Yeah. Okay. So what this is telling us is at this particular moment in time, the rate at which they were selling cars is this ninety six point four two eight nine six, which happens to be the same rate as the average for the year. So that overall average does happen to have an instantaneous rate of change at some point, and this is that special point guaranteed by that mean value theorem. Okay, Graphically, um, it seems like the average rate of change, the slope of the secant line, would be the same as a derivative, okay, aka slope of tangent line, and if this is a special spot, that's at 3.2915. So this was at 0 and this was at 12. Okay, so visually we can try to draw a little picture if that helps you. Are we doing okay so far? OK. 
okay? Um, let's go ahead and try the last one. It's going to be a table example. I know some people mentioned how um, reading a table can be difficult for them, so we're going to try we're going to try this one together. This table though is a little bit more involved because we have f values, g values, and their derivative values, so we have a lot to keep organized. It tells us that functions f and g are differentiable. So what else do we know? Yeah? They're also continuous. All right, continuous two. And g is strictly increasing, always going up. So if we know the original function's always going up, do we know something else? Can we think of a connection? Yeah. Um, well, we don't know concavity. So you can be increasing and concave down. You could be also be increasing and concave up. Okay? So if we're strict, if the original function is strictly increasing, this is actually all we know. Okay? Alright, the table above gives us some values. The function h, which doesn't happen to be in the table, is given by this equation. Okay, so we have something else going on here. Let's see, find the equation of a tangent line, we can definitely do that, to the graph of h at the x spot of 3. Okay, so if, I'm hoping it's been drilled into our brain so far. Equation of a tangent line, we need a point and a slope. We want it to the graph of h. So we've got to plug in 3 in for h, and then we eventually got to plug in 3 for the derivative. All right, now h, the equation, is given to us at the top. Let's go ahead and plug in 3. g of 3, based off the table, is 4. Is that right? And then if we take that 4 and plug it into f, we get negative 1. And then if we subtract 6, we'll get negative 7. All right, so there's our point value. What about the derivative? Can we think of a shortcut that we can use for this h function? Yeah, how? It's a chain. We have inside outside pieces. All right, so we need the derivative of the outside, which would be f prime. Keep the inside. Finish the chain rule by multiplying by the derivative of the inside. So that would be g prime. And technically, we should subtract the derivative of 6, because that's still a part of the h function, but we know that's just going to be 0 anyway. So here's our derivative. Let's go ahead and plug in 3. So based off the table, g of 3 is 4. And if I plug in 4 into f prime, I'll get 3. g prime of 3 based off the table is 2. So 3 times 2 will give us 6. So equation of tangent line, y plus 7 equals 6 times x minus 3. Kind of a throwback question, right? We can do that. What about B? Find the rate of change for H on the interval. Okay. Are they talking about that instantaneous rate of change or average rate of change? They don't really specify, but there is something else in there kind of hinting. Yeah? How do you know? Because the less than signs don't have the bars, or it's not continuous on the so you're thinking about the theorems. Um, find the average, or not average, find the rate of change for h on the interval. Like be 
Okay, so if it's an instantaneous rate of change, a rate of change at one moment, what's the one moment that they're talking about? You see how this is over time? Okay, this is an interval. So I guess the average rate of change is from beginning to end, but you can't really include the endpoints because if you start and stop there, you don't really have um, a rate, aka a derivative. So we're going to go ahead and just include everything in between those. So this is actually average rate of change, slope between two points. Um, let's go ahead and find the y values. That way we can use our algebra 1 slope formula. We already know what h of 3 is. We did that in part a. Let's find h of 1. If we plug 1 into g, we get 2. If we plug 2 into f, we get 9. And if we subtract 3, or sorry, if we subtract 6, we get 3. All right, so average rate of change, slope between two points. Subtract the y's, subtract the x's. negative 10 over 2, negative 5. So far so good. Hang it in there. Okay. Let's try C. Explain why there must be a value for R within this interval from 1 to 3. Okay not technically including the endpoints, but somewhere within that interval, such that h of this spot, okay, whatever number you want to pick between 1 and 3, would have an output of negative 2. Explain why there must be. So you, looking at that terminology, it seems like we have to check something, okay, check a condition. How do we know this is true? So this is kind of leading us into a theorem can we think about which one this particular question is referring to? If we want to see if a function value is something in particular, yeah. Value it's an intermediate value theorem. If you think about MVT and roles, that's normally dealing with a derivative, that instantaneous rate of change. This is simply asking you about a function value. So can we think about the conditions for the intermediate value theorem? I know it's a throwback all the way to unit one. Is there almost a condition that we can bet we have to check? Yeah? Is it continuous? Okay. So how do we know that the function h is continuous? We know the answer should be yes. Okay, explain why there must be, but we have to explain. How do you know if H is continuous? Can we think? Did they mention anything about continuity in the paragraph to kind of help us out? Yeah? So is that both of the functions that are used in H of differential Okay, so notice how they're telling us F and G are technically continuous because they use the word differentiable. They don't specify H here at all, but notice how the H function is comprised of those same functions, F and G. So since H of X is comprised of continuous functions, then h of x would have to be continuous as well. What gets a little tricky is if h of x was a fraction, like if we were dividing those, we would have a little hiccup, okay, because we know that can't be um, zero, so we might have a little issue there. But since this isn't a fraction, we really don't have anything to worry about. So we'll say yes, because h of x is made of two continuous functions. All right. Is there another condition for the intermediate value theorem? 
how do we know that we have an output or an answer of negative 2 somewhere? Anything, Jess? Because there's um, negative two would be in between y values of h of one. There we go. We found those here in part b, h of one, h of three. And intermediate is just a synonym for between. So this negative two has to be between something. Um, so we'll say the output of negative two is between the outputs of the interval. Okay, the interval was from 1 to 3, so if we plug in 1 and we plug in 3, we'll get out the outputs of 3 and negative 7. Okay, those are actually the two conditions for the uh, intermediate value theorem. You have to be continuous, and you have to make sure that the output you're searching for is between the outputs of the endpoints. Okay, so we'll explain why that should do it. Okay, we satisfied those two conditions. If you look at D, it's kind of similar. Explain why there is a value on the same interval, but this time it's asking us about the derivative, and specifically it equals negative 5. So can we think about the theorem that this one's kind of cluing us into? Yeah? Mean value, mean value theorem. Okay, so conditions for mean value theorem. Continuous and differentiable. Okay, um, we can say yes because h of x is made of two differentiable functions. Now I know those are really the only two conditions of the mean value theorem, but there is technically one more thing that we kind of have to be particular about. This value of negative five is something pretty specific, okay? Because what if I changed it to 20? What if I changed it to 75? That might affect our answer a little bit. Can we think about what this negative five is representing? Do you have an idea, Tyler? That's your average rate of change on the interval from 1 to 3. Do we already know the average rate of change on that interval? Do you notice how we did that in part B? Okay, something we already had, and that was negative 5. Okay, so if this was 20, okay, I don't think we would be able to explain why there must be 1 because the true average rate of change is not matching the value that they stated. So we do have that kicker. The average uh, rate of change, technically that they're, ma that they're using, matches the actual average rate of change. I know it might be a little overwhelming because we I tried to cram that in before the bell rang, but we're going to do um, some more of these tomorrow. We're going to have some station activities and go into the boards.